Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ashlyn. I go by she, her pronouns, and I'm pleased to be your host for this new media session for our Ryerson Virtual Open House, which is taking place all of this week. And because of that, there are many sessions that you might be interested in. So please check out our website and sign up for any and all sessions that may be of interest to you. To start, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land. So if you don't mind, let's skip over to the next slide. Thank you. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Before we get started, I just wanted to mention that Ryerson has shifted to an essential services model to help prevent the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have put together a series of virtual sessions in order to share information and connect with you. Ryerson is working diligently to provide students with fulsome experiences while maintaining the health and safety of our community. I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll to uh, find out who is speaking, who is listening in today. So there we go, launch the poll. Gonna give everyone just a few seconds to fill that out. Perhaps you're a prospective student looking to join us next fall. Perhaps you're looking into joining us further on in the future. Maybe you're a university or college transfer student, a parent or guardian, or maybe even a teacher or a counselor. So I'll let you take a couple seconds to fill that out. All right, so here we go. Let's share the results. Seems that the majority of you are prospective students looking to join us next fall, but we do, we do have some students looking to join us even further into the future, some university and college transfer students, and as well as some parents and guardians, which we love to see. So we're super happy that you're here and that you're just starting your research into looking at post-secondary options. But before I pass it off, I do wanna just give you some quick Zoom housekeeping tips. First, we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, we have many faculty and staff on the back end ready to go for questions and we will be doing some live questions at the, the end of this uh, presentation. To do so, you simply click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. A, a second screen should pop up when you do that. There you can type out your, your question and send it to us. If you are having any audio or video issues, feel free to flag it to us by using that Q&A pod. One of our staff members will be on hand to assist you. Also, you can rearrange your screen any which way any which way you'd like. It's not going to affect the way we see it on our end or the way other um, attendees see it on their end. Finally, this presentation is being closed captioned to ensure accessibility. So if you require closed captioning, please select the CC option at the bottom of your Zoom window. Also note that this session is being recorded and will be available on our website on a later date. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce David from the New Media Program to start us off with this presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming to our New Media Virtual Open House. I'm very excited today to be uh, talking to you about our program and uh, sharing with you, you know, some, some great projects we've been doing over the years. Um, I, so I will be presenting. I'm David. Uh, I'm a faculty member in New Media. Um, I'm also program director this year, and uh, I've been at Ryerson since uh, 2010. Uh, joining me in the presentation today, also uh, Tess Sutherland will take over. We're going to be sharing the mic back and forth. Uh, Tess is our um, uh, senior production technician, and uh, maybe Tess, do you want to say hi before we start? I don't know if you're in the room. Sure. Hi, everybody. So excited to be here today and talk to you a little bit more about new media. And as David said, I will, I will be back with you very shortly in this presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Tess. All right. Um, so uh, right before I, I dive into things, um, this is our social media handles uh, at Ryzen New Media. Um, you can follow us on Twitter uh, and on Instagram if you want to see some uh, some student work or just want to keep up with uh, what, what we're up to in the program. This is a great place to connect with us as well, in addition to the usual channels through the, uh, the Ryerson website. Um, so I believe you may be receiving some of those links uh, in the chat right now. Uh, and if not, you know, this it's pretty easy to find us um, at Ryerson New Media. So I wanted to put that on your radar. Okay, so let's get into it. 
Um, so what is new media? Well, new media at its core is a, is a four-year bachelor of fine art, uh, or a BFA, as we call it. Uh, this is important because uh, fine art is really going to be the lens through which we operate uh, in this program. Uh, it's going to be our context and our background. Uh, and it defines you know, the kinds of, of projects we look at, but also the, the methods that we teach you and the, the a way of working. Uh, so I like to think of new media uh, as essentially a sandbox where you're going to get to explore the intersection of art and technology. Uh, and you'll see new media as a very open-ended uh, program. It's fairly broad, but you know this is the space in which we operate. Uh, and we're called new media, but re really we're interested in all media forms, both old and new, and finding new interesting ways to combine them. So what I'll be doing uh, in this presentation, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about um, how we achieved that, how we how we pulled this off, and what that means to you as a prospective student. Um, so first off, I'm going to start just to give you a little bit of an overview of our curriculum and talk about classes. Um, I'm not going to dive into detail into specific courses here, but I want to just give you the bird's eye view, the big picture of um, how our program is structured and kind of the philosophy behind it. Uh, so if you see on my uh, screen here, I have a box called Foundations. Uh, so those are courses you will take in your first year uh, and a part of your second year. Uh, and these are both in, in theory areas and also skill building. Uh, so you're going to have courses in areas like new media history, media theory, courses about the creative processes. And in terms of skill courses, you're going to have you know video courses, sound, digital media. Uh, we're going to teach you about coding, programming, electronics, uh, fabrication, working with tools, and more digital fabrication method. Uh, we're going to talk about things like experience design and interactive storytelling. Um, and the idea behind this foundation is to give you uh, to introduce you to a wide range of areas and new production techniques that you're going to then be, be able to apply through the rest of the, the degree. Uh, so for the most part, all of these foundation courses, they're all required and everyone gets to take them. Uh, and then moving on to the middle portion here around um, you know, some of your second year and some of your third year in the program, um, this is where I kind of split this into two general areas. Uh, so you're going to have courses that are going to be centered around building a studio practice. And what I mean by this is uh, these are going to be studios that are going to be project-based. You're going to bring your ideas to the table. You're going to develop concepts, and you're going to implement uh, and exhibit you know, artworks and projects that you're interested in making uh, through the guidance of faculty members. Um, and then in the studio practice portion of the course, we're also going to be talking about uh, you know, creating community connections. We have some practical courses around you know, what does it mean to write a project proposal? How do you get funding for your work? Talking about the various arts councils and, you know, local institutions and galleries and museums and things like this. Um, and then in parallel to this, we have lots of great electives. And one of the key features of the new media program uh, is that it is very open. Uh, there's actually 12 electives in total you get to choose uh, within the program. Some of them can be internal, some of them can be external, which means they come from other schools around FCAD or even other faculties. Um, and of course, you can use that space to take minors as well. So we give you a lot of choice in how you customize your experience in new media based on your own uh, personal interests. Um, so some of the electives we offer internally, you know, we have lots of different topics ranging from you know, things like data visualization, uh, building you know, robots, virtual reality, advanced uh, fabrication, you know, social media, gaming, um, and some of the external things people will be doing. You, know, you can take courses in, of course, some of the other schools in FCAD, um, take courses in our sister programs, which are media production and sport media. Uh, but we also have students reaching outside. For example, many of our students decide to take uh, minors in areas like computer science or you know even psychology or things like this. So it's a very um, very open-ended program that gives you a lot of freedom to customize uh, based on your specific interests and things that you want to go deeper in. Um, so this is kind of the middle portion of the course. And then a little bit later on uh, at the end, uh, this all culminates towards a thesis. So this is a one-year major project uh, and uh, that culminates into a public exhibition Exhibition we call Meta. Um, and then there's a component of fourth year as well. This is all about future planning. So we 
walk you through a masterclass with lots of guest speakers and help you transition into the real world afterwards and think about where you're going to take things from there. Uh, so this is the big picture overview of the, of the course and, and the curriculum. And we place a big emphasis on hands-on studio courses. We actually get to make projects, work with, work with your peers, and work your, with faculty uh, to implement these ideas, not just talk about them. Uh, so on that note, I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about some of our experiential learning opportunities. This is another uh, key feature of new media. We have lots of opportunities for students to work on projects outside the classroom. Uh, and I'm going to go through these you know, relatively quickly uh, down the road. If you have more questions about any of those, I'm really happy to address them. Uh, so over the years, we've been developing lots of connections with local partners and organizations. Uh, so I'm going to give you some examples of that. Um, about five years ago, we did a project with uh, TIFF, which is uh, the International Film Festival, uh, for an exhibition called the Digi Play Space. Uh, this project I'm showing you was an interactive uh, uh, LED wall that was developed in collaboration with artist uh, Micah Scott. And our students got to work on the implementation and the installation for that, uh, that project. We also worked with TIFF on uh, this other piece called Marshmallow Clouds. Uh, this was an interactive installation where these suspended clouds would uh, change their colors based on how people would walk underneath them. And in this project, our students got to actually, uh, this was a, a piece by a group called Tangible Interaction out of Vancouver. Uh, in this project, our students actually got to design a portion of the exhibit, uh, specifically the mechanism that kept the clouds inflated. And they also got to participate uh, in the gallery uh, installation. Uh, another major partner we've worked with over the last few years has been the Ontario Science Center, um, or the OSC. Uh, and we've done a number of, of courses with them in which we've implemented projects that ended up on the floor of the Ontario Science Center as, as uh, exhibit pieces. Uh, and this is a great example of a collaboration where we get our students who have a fine art training to apply their skills and creativity to a different context. So even though the Science Center is a museum, uh, it's not really an art museum. You know, it's, it's got a totally different audience, which tends to be uh, kids and, and, um, and uh, younger children. So this is a great challenge for our students to take their creative skills and their project building skills and then apply them to a different, different context. Uh, so this was a project called uh, Bitmorph in 2015, where we created uh, a number of podiums with these uh, these um, holograms here, these kind of 3D holograms. And this was a, a game that visitors could play by visiting the different podiums uh, that were scattered across the, the museum. Uh, we did some more projects with the uh, Ontario Science Center that was in 2017. Uh, these were just two examples of uh, st uh, student projects. The one on the left here um, was this uh, infinity mirror that was controlled by a joystick. Uh, so it was, um, you could draw patterns on the light and it created this illusion of an infinity um, kind of light tunnel. Um, and the project on the right here is a, the, the giant cardboard tree that you see there uh, is a, uh, an interactive tree made out of um, recyclable materials. Uh, it contained lots of interactive components and it had an animatronic, uh, animatronic uh, cardboard owl inside of it that would move and greet visit visitors. Um, these are more recent projects we've done with the Ontario Science Center. Uh, this was in uh, December of 2019. Uh, we've created some uh, interactive exhibits. Uh, the one on the left is this kind of like a virtual fish tank where, um, where kids could come and, and get creatures to grow and thrive in this virtual uh, environment uh, through this, uh, this interface. And then the project on the right is a, a sound installation, uh, kind of like an upright bass that has three sides that different people can play at the same time uh, and create uh, th these deep vibrations, but also movements of light. Uh, so some very uh, playful, uh, hands-on interactive projects. And uh, this is my son, by the way, on the, on the left here, interacting with the, uh, the fish tank. Uh, so in addition to all of these uh, experiential learning opportunities, we also have um, lots of great international opportunities. Uh, we've been uh, running a course now. I think it, it's in its second iteration. Uh, obviously, we did not do this course uh, this year because of the pandemic, but um, we'll be going back to that in the near future, 
where we took a group of students to New York um, to visit with, um, with institutions there and also take a tour of galleries. Uh, in this picture, this is our students who are meeting with uh, Daniel Schiffman, who's a professor at uh, NYU's Interactive Telecommunication Program. Uh, he's also well known for running a YouTube channel called The Coding Train. Uh, so this is another example of um, how through new media, we have lots of opportunities for our students that reach uh, beyond the Ryerson campus. Uh, so at this point in the presentation, I'm gonna pass the mic over to uh, Tess. And uh, so she's gonna tell you a little bit more about our facilities and our studios. Yeah, so um, one of the things that makes Ryerson and particularly RTA and particularly new media so special is our access to all kinds of cutting costs or cutting edge rather facilities um, all across campus. So you're seeing here in this photo, the production of some um, laser cutting, 3D printing uh, and CNC milled projects. So these are some of the tools that our students have regular access to that live in our spaces um, and students make tons of projects out of these. In addition to these, we have some 24 seven spaces that are available for our students to work on their projects all the time, including our workshop facility. Um, so these are a couple of photos of our workshop. So this is at open and accessible to students at all times. We have traditional kind of like woodworking um, and fabrication tools in here. We also have a CNC mill, which is a computer controlled router. Um, and as I said, in the last picture, you could see you can cut all kinds of things out of woods and metals and all sorts of different materials. And adjacent to this room, we also have a whole suite of 3D printers, um, all different kinds of printers, all different kinds of filament students have 24 seven access to explore and experiment with those tools. And then this is sort of the heart of the new media program, as we say. So this is our makerspace, and this is where students spend a huge amount of their academic and social life during us in new media. So this is a space where anything happens. So uh, the workshop has some specific applications, but the makerspace is where you do anything else and where you hang out with all of your friends in new media. What happens in the makerspace is really special because there's so much shoulder to shoulder and peer to peer learning. So when you're working on a project in the makerspace and you have a question, chances are that somebody else in the room knows the answer. And it's a really important part of our program. In addition to these spaces, we have access to facilities all across campus, including this cutting edge space, the Creative Technology Lab. This is a relatively new space on campus and it's full of just the most wonderful and amazing fabrication tools you can imagine, including um, two KUKA robot arms, which you're seeing in the top right here. These robot arms can be used for a million different purposes, including what you're seeing here, which is 3D printing massive scale projects. In the CTL, there's also large scale laser cutters, so four foot by eight foot beds and large scale CNC mills. Um, and just a whole host of other metalworking tools and other fabrication tools that are really special and unique to this space. So those are our facilities. In addition, one other thing that we should mention as part of RTA, you also get access into our equipment and distribution facility. And so that is a space where we have tons of media production tools. So things like cameras and microphones and computers. All of those things are accessible to you as a new media student to rent, to utilize in any of your projects and academic work. Um, so that's a space you have access into as well. So we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about the new media community. I already alluded to it, but it's what we feel makes the new media program beyond compare and so incredibly special. Um, we have a community new media that is so oriented around students and student goals. Uh, and student ideas. And so what you're seeing on the screen here right now, this is called Sim Night, um, which is a, a student showcase event that we run on campus and off campus. So you're seeing it here in an external gallery space. This is that InterAccess in Toronto. Um, and so on the next slide, uh, you'll see another event that we run, which is called Pop Matrix. So this is a student run pop-up shop. So as you may have guessed from my discussion of the facilities, our students make so many intricate and exciting projects. And so our pop-up shop is a space where students can sell that work. So in this photo, you can see some students are selling screen printing and resin casting and photography. Um, so this is another one of these events that makes our community really special. 
But as I said, everything that our community does is really integral to the learning in new media. So we run all sorts of different events. There's another set of events we do called Get Goods, which are student-led workshops for uh, students to learn a new skill from each other. And those workshops can be related to the work that you'll do with us in the program, but they can also be related to anything. So we do workshops in uh, movement studies and in freestyle rapping and DJing along with code and 3D printing and 3D design. Um, so all of the things that our community does helps bolster the work that we do inside of our classroom spaces. So um, I think David already mentioned this a little bit, but in our fourth year at the end of the program, you go through your thesis year and you build out a thesis project. And at the end of that is what we call META, which is our end of year, fourth year thesis showcase. So we're looking at a photo from META two years ago um, in a gallery space. We open it up to the public, all sorts of professionals in the new media fields come and see student work. Um, and so it's, it's a really exciting way to get connected into the broader professional community just as you're about to graduate. And then I think we also have some photos on the next slide from Meta this year. So obviously things shifted a little bit in the spring given the pandemic. Um, so these are some of the incredible works that our students made uh, gearing up for Meta this year. These are some thesis projects. And so instead of running offsite and in a gallery space, we ran online this year in a really novel virtual context. Um, and so I know we're not, uh, we can't share the link in the chat, but if you look up ryersonmeta.ca, uh, you'll find all sorts of documentation of all the really incredible and wonderful projects that were made by the graduating class this year. So this is a nice transition into what happens after new media. So what are the opportunities that come from graduating this program? You can see I'm actually wearing a shirt that has this graphic on it. And this is a graphic we love to show because it shows you just how broad this program really is. So all of the things that are in um, regular texts are different skills that you'll learn with us throughout your, your time as a new media student. And all of those bolded parts of the text those are careers that our graduates have gone on to have. So we set you up for success in any number of fields. Um, anything that interests you in relating to new media art, creative practice, um, creative businesses, all those kinds of things are spaces that our students go <clears throat> coming out of the new media program. Um, and in addition to all those exciting directions, because our program is so rigorous and sets you up for such great academic success, we also have loads of students go and specialize in a graduate program. So there's lots of fields going out of new media. It's a really broad program. And as David mentioned in his overview of the curriculum, you're given a lot of flexibility to specialize in areas that are of interest to you. So if you wanna go into web design, there's space for that. If you wanna be a digital fabricator, there's space for that too. If you wanna be an entrepreneur or an artist, we make space for all of those pathways in the new media program. Thank you, Tess. Um also to add to that is this, this is also um, you know if you're if you don't know what you want to be um, this is also a great program to come and discover it uh, because we're going to show you lots of new opportunities you know ways of making you maybe have not thought about or that are just aren't on your radar yet um, so it's a it's a it's a great program to come in you know a little bit undecided I would say um, but decidedly curious. Uh, and open-minded and have a, a will to explore and try new things and uh, discover new ways of making and creating. Uh, thank you so much, Jess. That was really great. Thanks, David. Uh, just one last thing I'll, I'll throw in is uh, if you visit our Instagram, which is just at Ryerson New Media, that's our handle on all social media. If you visit our Instagram, we have a hashtag. The link is in our bio. It's hashtag Alumni Monday. And we have all kinds of featured interviews with grads and you can really see the breadth of the kind of programs and professional fields that our graduates move into. 
Yes, thank you. I was about to forget that myself. Um, and uh, yes, Alumni Monday is a really great um, you know, way not to just take our word for it, but uh, to go learn about some you know real uh, students who graduated and learn about you know what they are doing. And and the, the the one thing they all have in common is they're doing wildly different things, which is amazing. Um, it also I you know we also have a it, it brings me also to mention we have a vibrant alumni community uh, and Meta, the exhibition we talked about is really the place where all of this gets tied together. And we have students who've graduated now, um, you know, over a decade ago, still coming back to Meta every year uh, to, to meet the, the graduating class and sometimes the higher students straight out of our end of year exhibition. Okay. Uh, so I thought I'd, I'd put this slide in there just to recap what we've been talking about and try to summarize in a few lines, you know, what new media is. Uh, so in my mind, the things that define new media um, is it's an open curriculum, right? It's a place where we're going to give you a foundation, but uh, we also leave a lot to you to figure out what you're interested in and kind of carve out your own program uh, because every student is different and every student has different interests coming in. So we, we create the space for you to grow and explore the, these ideas. Um, we have a big focus on experiential learning, which means taking our learning outside of the classroom and applying it to real world projects through connections with you know, cultural institutions, art institutions, uh, and uh, getting our, the chance for our students to actually go out there and experience you know, making for the public and creating installations that will get to live in art galleries and museum and public spaces. Uh, we have cutting edge facilities and we're gonna introduce you to cutting edge tools and ways of making uh, and give you access to a, a wide range of studios and places where you can realize your creative visions. Uh, most importantly, New Media is a thriving community like Tess touched on. Um, we are a relatively small program, but everyone's very close within New Media. You will get to know all of your professors on a first name basis, and they will get to know you after four, after four years of the program. Um, it's a really great place to make, um, you know, long life, not just friends, but also um, future partners, collaborators. Uh, and finally, I think new media is really um, lots of future opportunities. Uh, many of the things you're going to be making after you graduate, many of the jobs you're going to be in uh, just don't even exist yet in some cases. Um, so I think new media is a good place to position yourself in terms of being forward looking and future thinking. So this is the, the summary of our, our program, and hopefully you'll have lots of questions for us. But before we move on to question, I want to touch on a little bit about the application process, uh, what to expect, and give you a few tips as well. Uh, so how to apply to new media? Well, of course, you can get much more detail if you go to the admissions website. This is just going to be the um, high-level perspective. Uh, so the main thing to remember is that we are a grade plus program. And what that means is that uh, plus is we need more than your transcript if you're going to apply. Uh, so the, in terms of the admission process, how much the plus uh, contributes, it's about 50% your grades and then 50% the plus, which is the other things we'll get into in a second. Uh, so in order to apply to new media, um, you have to provide basically two things. Um, one is going to be a writing sample. Um, this is where you're going to tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, and you're going to answer some questions about creativity. Those questions can change from year to year, uh, but they're very you know, personal and uh, they're fairly open-ended. You know, we just want to see, um, we just want to learn a little bit more about you and we want to see what you're passionate about uh, through this writing sample. Uh, and then you're going to submit a portfolio of uh, up to five pieces. And uh, the, these uh, pieces, these artworks, these projects, they can be uh, in any medium. Okay? Uh, that could be you know, video, painting, games, sculptures, robots, poetry, your cosplay, costumes, sock puppets. Um, we really mean any medium. Uh, anything that you've made that you're being creative with and that you're passionate about can be pieces in your portfolio. Uh, we want to see your own interests, uh, so not just homework. You probably should not have more than two or three homework pieces in there. Uh, we want to see projects that you made because you cared and you actually wanted to make them and not just because your teacher gave you an assignment. Uh, so try to include a mixture of classwork, but also things you've made outside of class. Uh, so everything is submitted online for the portfolio, which means if you have some object-based works like sculptures or things that you've made, you're simply going to document them and then submit that documentation. 
Uh, and then edit for your best work. This is hard, uh, but you know, just make sure that you select a variety of projects that showcase um, you know, different things and uh, that show you in your best light. And finally, uh, just you know, be yourself. That's, uh, that's usually the best, uh, best way to approach it. Okay. All right, so thank you so much um, for listening to our presentation and joining us. Hopefully you have uh, some questions that we can answer uh, live or in the chat. We do have some questions all lined up for um, you to answer. Um, the Excellent. first one comes from, the first one comes from a student who is interested in video games. Is there an opportunity to take courses exploring this? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in new media, uh, the, the short answer is yes, there are some opportunities. Um, so we have, you know, we have in the first year, we have an introductory um, programming courses. Uh, and then within the school, we have uh, some, some courses that explore video games. We have about three electives in that space. Uh, we also have a virtual reality course that ties into uh, game engines. And we have a, an elective where we look at game engines as a production tool, kind of like doing virtual sets and things like this. Uh, so there's a few different touch points here that relate to video games. Um, you also have opportunities to develop games as your projects in many of the, the studios I talked about, as well as your thesis. Uh, every year we've had students interested in, in that aspect. Uh, so it is not, we're not per se, uh, we're not focused on games. So unlike a specialized program, like at a college, for example, where you would just do something very specific uh, new media is a little bit more well-rounded, uh, but in many ways that can be an advantage because you're going to gain other perspectives that are not just uh, technical as it relates to the gaming industry. Um, and then this is also a great opportunity to experiment and create, you know, just really experimental games. We've had students make, um, you know, games that had their own, you know, custom controllers, for example. And then because our students learn electronics, they were able to develop the game, but also invent the interface for the game at the same time, for example. Can I also just add that um, Chris Alexander is one of our well-known professors who teaches video games. And so if you're interested in some of the work that's happening inside class, you can follow at video games prof on, I think all social media, as that's his platform, including uh, on Twitch. That's amazing and great plug, Tess. Um, this next question is um, regarding coding and computers. So for a designer or coding, what laptop do you recommend? Um, any, really, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it, yeah, it's the, the most of the tools we used are uh, they are open source tools. Uh, some of them are even uh, browser based. In our first year coding class, we learn uh, JavaScript in a programming environment called P5. Uh, and uh, it doesn't require a very powerful computer necessarily. Uh, so I always tell students not to worry too much about which laptop they would get. Um, anything that, you know, my laptop is six year old now and uh, it, I'm doing just fine doing my own work and teaching my courses. Uh, we have students who run Macs, uh, I run Windows, so it's, uh, pretty much whatever you have or whatever you, you want to get is probably going to be okay. You also have access to computers um, in our equipment distribution center. So there are some laptops that you can rent, um, including both Windows and Mac machines. And we also have computer labs on campus that also include some of the paid softwares that we work with in some of our courses. Yeah, and that, um distribution center that Tess was uh, was talking about um, is actually, it works like a library. So there's no like additional fees unless you submit something late, uh, exactly like a library. And our library system also has um, computers that you can take out um, if you need any. Um, is there going to be some sort of, um, is there going to be portfolio review day this year? Good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, Maybe somebody else who's in the room does. I can jump in. Uh, yep. <laughs> Unless someone else knows. Great. <laughs> um, I don't believe there's any specific um, for this specific program, 
in terms, I don't think we're doing program specific review days this year, but we are participating in National Portfolio Day, which has a few upcoming events. Uh, the Faculty of Communication and Design is uh, very involved with that. So uh, please check out that website for more information, but also all of our details for what's required in a portfolio are on our website, like David has discussed a little earlier. Um, yes, so on that note, actually, so we have, uh, again, we don't have a way of, I believe, sharing links right in the chat directly with um, attendees, but if there's a way we can follow up later on, or if you go to the Ryerson website, we also have a video that was recorded by uh, my colleague, Steve Daniels, where he gives some very useful portfolio tips um, on you know what to include in your portfolio. It's a short little clip. Um, and then whether or not we end up having um, uh, some kind of official portfolio review day. Uh, if you have questions about your portfolio or even what to include, or you're unsure, um, I can. you can also just reach out to us directly. Uh, you can find even my email address on uh, the, the program website. And uh, you're more than welcome to uh, email me directly with questions about your portfolio. Uh, you know, don't be intimidated by this. Um, any one of us would be more than happy to, to help you out to answer your questions about the program. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've had students reach out directly over the years and uh, there's, uh, that's a, also a great way to and get your you know, portfolio questions answered. Just reach out directly to us. The website that David is referring to is ryerson.ca slash RTA. And if you navigate to the new media section of that website, you can find all of our admission requirements there. Great, okay, this next question, uh, the student is asking, are there graphic design opportunities in this program and could I become a graphic designer after graduating from this program? That's a great question. Um, so there, the graphic design side of things is, uh, is pretty minimal when it comes to new media. Uh, we have a course in first year where we do a digital media course where we introduce everyone to you know, basic Photoshop, After Effects, things like this. And we have, um, we have uh, but beyond that, it's not a big focus of some of our, of our electives. Uh, there are some graphic design courses you can take as electives through uh, Pro programs like the GCM, the Graphics Communication Management School, uh, but the uh, in terms of courses, there's not a big focus on uh, on graphic design. Uh, that said, every cohort has students who are really great designers, and there's a lot of opportunities to uh, practice your graphic design skills, whether it's getting involved in the community activities. Um, in, in our exhibition meta, for example, we have students who always design the website, do the motion graphics for it. Um, so the, uh, there's a lot of, of room for you to practice and apply graphic design through the program, uh, but it's not something that we spend a lot of time uh, teaching. Uh, so if you're you know, interested in doing some of that on your own or on the side, or if you already have some great design skills, uh, new media is a great place to take those skills and then go a little further with it perhaps uh, or maybe apply your graphic design abilities to you know things you didn't think of um, already and just branch out a little bit more amazing thank you um, this student is asking a little bit about um, internships and employment after graduation. They ask, does the new media program have any connections to companies that provide internships and or employment? Uh, we, we do have some connections. So in new media, there's no required internship. So there is a course you can take, or if you, if you have an, an internship opportunity, you can, uh, we have a structure in place where you can go and do that internship. Um, we have some awards that end up in a summer internship um, and with, at, with one company in particular called Envivo. Uh, they do uh, new media ideas, but applied to the, the medical space. Um, and, uh, but we don't have a required internship. Uh, so what that means is you know, we have opportunities we might share with students uh, and the internship can take place either through the elective or um, can also happen uh, outside of class. So we don't have a placement program for any of this, uh, but we do have a network of people who often contact us for, uh, for either recent graduates or current grads to help on projects. And we pass those opportunities on to students. 
Um, we also have a, something called creative practice hours, which tends to be a little bit more focused towards um, internal. So during the, your time at New Media, you have to complete 60 of these creative practice hours. Uh, these are not really an internship. They're much more like volunteer work. Uh, but we've had students connect with organizations through these uh, in various ways, whether it's, um, you know, learning on their uh, a professional artist and helping with their uh, exhibition or installation, uh, maybe connecting with some local not-for-profits or cultural institutions. Uh, so we've had some of those opportunities as well. They're a great way to start to build some contacts for what you're going to do post-graduation. Great, all right. Uh, this is our next question. Uh, does this program have any film courses? Can it lead to a career in film and television? I uh, no, probably this is probably not the best route. If you want to, if you want a career in film, I would really recommend um, taking the film studies program or uh, another program in our department called media production. That's really much focused on uh, production for television. Uh, so we have, you know, we have introductory video courses, um, but this is is really not our focus. Um, it, you know, it doesn't exclude it, of course, and we've had students uh, who ended up even through taking new media in some of these areas, uh, but the, um, it's, it's maybe not the most direct path to a career in those industries. Amazing. This next question has to do with those non-academic requirements. The student is asking, what makes a portfolio stand out? And are you looking for pieces that are strictly related to technology in some way? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so to, to answer the second part first, uh, the answer is no, we're not looking for pieces who are only technology based. Uh, in fact, we are aware, you know, most students through your high school experience or maybe what you've had access to, maybe you did not have access to some of these tools, for example, uh, a lot of the high school art class classes are around video production, painting, more traditional forms of art making. Um, so that's totally fine. It doesn't have to be technology driven. Although if it is, of course, we encourage you to, to include them. Um, the thing that's going to make you stand out, what we're looking for in those portfolios is we want to see uh, two things. First, we want to get students who are interested in, in art. And so we want to see that you've taken some time to you know, have ideas and figure out ways to communicate them through various mediums. Um, and we also want to see your ideas shining through your creativity, through your work. And what I mean by that is, you know, not just some cookie cutter assignments, which um, you'll, as, as someone who's reviewed hundreds and hundreds of portfolios over the year, uh, I can tell when, you know, a project was on the high school curriculum because lots of applicants have more or less the same project because uh, it's just an assignment they all had to do, right? Everybody had to do something very similar. Uh, so those projects don't necessarily help you stand out as much um, as something that maybe you did through maybe a class you took outside of school or just, you know, something that relates to a passion that you have or maybe a hobby that you have, you know, perhaps you're really into painting minifigures, right? And you've just made some amazing models Please showcase those. We want to see people who are passionate and who have interests outside of school or, or that go beyond their schoolwork. Uh, so those things will really help your portfolio stand out. Um, the other thing that will vastly help your portfolio as well is if you can try to showcase a little bit of diversity in your work. Uh, by nature, New Media is a pretty open-ended program. We go, we touch on a lot of different ways of making which means if you have five projects that are, for example, all paintings or all drawings or all sculptures, this is not as strong as a portfolio that shows a little bit of a mixture, right? You've tried different things. Yep. Amazing. All right, this next question is, is this program coding heavy? And maybe to go along with that question, we can say, we can also ask how much coding, if any, do students need prior to entering this program? Um, okay, that's another great question. You guys have awesome questions today. Uh, so the uh, to again to answer from from the la latter part, uh, everyone takes an introductory coding course in first year, and the experience required in that space is none. So we uh, assume nobody knows how to code, uh, and we're going to teach you the basics. And the reason why we teach 
everyone coding is uh, there's two primary reasons. One, of course, is we want to give you skills that if you want to apply coding to your projects, you're going to have some foundation in doing that. And if you want to go deeper, we have electives that go a lot more in depth in, in programming. Uh, but even if you realize this is not your cup of tea, maybe this is not for you, just being exposed to the concepts and knowing how programming works will position you much better in the future to perhaps collaborate with people who are you know, great coders, um, maybe even become a manager of a team that includes artists and coders and so forth, because you can speak the language and you understand the constraints and the parameters. Um, so for that reason, everyone takes coding in first year. And then after that, uh, because our program is pretty open-ended, um, how much coding you're gonna have to do depends on how much coding you want and which electives you decide to choose. We have certain electives that are more coding intensive. For example, this semester I teach a course um, on generative and algorithmic art, where we create projects primarily through coding that are randomized and self-generating. And these, this course obviously has a lot of code in it, um, we have other electives which have none. So beyond that first year, it's going to be up to you to decide, you know, do I want to go deeper into that area? Maybe you want to focus on other aspects of the program, whether it's, you know, new media or interaction design, uh, sorry, not new media, video or interaction design or, you know, sound. We have lots of great sound courses, excuse me. Uh, so that's largely up to you, but everyone will do a little bit in first year. So we have a common ground and a common language to communicate. Uh, and the same thing goes with our electronics courses, by the way. So everyone is introduced to building circuits using a platform called Arduino. Uh, and you're going to do a little bit of that in your second year. And then if you want to go deeper, we offer you some electives courses to do that. Great. Thank you for that. This next question asks, are there any study abroad opportunities within this program? Uh, yes, there is. We have a lot of our students who uh, typically that takes place in the um, winter of third year. And I believe these opportunities are available to most FCAD students uh, in most programs. We have a, an international studies office. It's not their actual name, but they're close. Um, so we have a number of students every year who go and study abroad. And we have a number of connections with uh, new media related programs and many universities. We have students go to Germany and Singapore and Hong Kong and lots of interesting places. Uh, so typically the study abroad is, yes, it's in the winter semester of, of third year. Uh, you go away, you do a whole term at another university, and uh, we have many programs to choose from that, um, that relate to new media just in, uh, in different institutions. Um, in addition to the study abroad semester, RTA has three study abroad courses, including um, one David mentioned earlier. So we have uh, a course um, last year that ran in New York, um, but we've also done some projects where we've collaborated with folks internationally. Um, and so there's, there's also that opportunity. So they don't always incorporate travel, but sometimes we work with folks all around the world um, to make projects and interests in art. All right. So this next question has to do again with those non-academic requirements. There just seems to be a bit of confusion about the written statements. The student's asking, are we supposed to write about all of our five pieces? Uh, no. In fact, if you go to the um, uh, if you go to the admissions page, you'll see that for the written statement. Um, I'm going to paraphrase here because I don't have it in front of me, but there's basically two short questions to answer. Um, the first question is you're going to write um, a statement about why you want to be in new media and uh, why you're interested in this program. And hopefully that should be uh, easy for you to write. And then the second question is you're going to tell us about something awesome. That's it. That's the question. All right, this student is asking, I am looking to be some sort of videographer, video editor. After post-secondary, either as a freelancer or as, uh, as a part of a corporate communications team, would this program help me build the skills I need for that? Uh, yeah, to some degree, for sure. Uh, we're, we have video courses. Uh, we have editing courses you can take if you want to go into that space. Um, 
again, I would encourage you to maybe try to have a bit of an open mind when you approach something like new media. We have many students who come in um, thinking, well, they want to become a freelance video editor because that's maybe what you know at this point in your life. Um, so you can come in with those skills and those, um, those interests. But uh, just remember that new media is going to be quite a bit more than any one of those particular areas. Uh, so there are some courses that you can take, which will give you the skills to do this. Uh, but you're going to also learn about a whole palette, a whole range of other uh, practices that you can then bring into that initial interest. And uh, odds are you're probably going to end up something completely different, uh, somewhere completely different than what you thought you would, where you thought you would end up uh, when you first came into this program. That tends to happen quite a lot. Amazing. Thank you. Um, this student is asking, I heard there's concentrations within this program. Could you explain that a little further, please? Uh, we do not, in fact, have concentrations. Uh, we did at one point um, have concentrations. They, they were discontinued a couple of years ago. In the, so they're no longer available. They might still be on some versions of the calendar from years back because current students are grandfathered into this concentration idea. Uh, the reason we discontinued them is, uh, you know, we had concentrations and uh, we found, you know, students, it did not actually help students uh, because we had these predefined areas that they could concentrate in. Uh, we found students wanted more flexibility. Oh, I think we lost David a little bit. Uh, maybe Tess can um, jump in for the next question. And if you don't know the answer, Tess, don't worry. Just mm -hmm. let me know. The next question is asking, um, how are students getting some hands-on opportunities during COVID? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, obviously, we're in a really unique context right now. Um, and so we are still doing almost every single production course that we regularly do, we're just shifting into an online world that we do it in. So a great example is our second year mandatory electronics course. It's called Tangible Media. And in this course, you learn intro to circuitry, electronics and robotics. Um, and so this course usually is really heavy hands-on using all of our facilities. And what we've done this year is we sent all of our students in the course, a kit of materials that they could use to build all of their circuitry. So we sent this massive box to students all around the world. We had students joining us as far away as Bahrain and China and Hong Kong, and all of these students received a kit from us um, full of part CUs. So we're still doing that hands-on learning that's so essential to the new media program. We've just figured out ways to bring that into your household. Um, obviously, for those of you who are applying now or for the, the fall 2021 class, we don't know what that looks like yet because we don't know what will change in the pandemic. But I can assure you that the staff team and the faculty are doing everything we can to assure that no matter what fall 2021 looks like, you will be able to get hands on with some technology. Well, that's great to hear. And I'm sure many, many people at home or where, wherever you're watching from are super excited to know that. Um, I definitely be excited. I almost want to sign up for the program myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, this next question is, um, is there a specific coding language that we learn in classes or are free to explore or are we free to explore? I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, I think David mentioned our first year coding class, we learn uh, JavaScript. We do it in an environment called P5JS, but it's a port of JavaScript. So we're learning Java there, or sorry, JavaScript rather, not Java. Um, and then we also do Arduino in our electronics class. And Arduino is a C, C++ based language. So there are some specific languages that we look at, but then we also have a huge amount of flexibility in our other courses. If you're really interested in a particular language and you wanna incorporate that into a project, we're always open to that. And we also have lots of students who take courses in other languages through the um, computer science faculty. So lots of our students take courses in Python, for example, through computer science. So if you're really into code, there's also those opportunities. 
Thank you. And welcome back, David. <laughs> yes, sorry about that. Um, my no computer worries. froze up there for a second. I apologize. Um, I don't know how much you heard of my answer about concentrations or if tests completed it. Um, I think we heard most of it. It did cut off at the end, but um, yeah. should anyone have any want uh, any further yeah. clarification, um, feel free to ask now um, or contact uh, the department via email. Um, I do want to get to this next question. It also has to do with non-academic requirements. Um, the student is asking, do we need to provide a resume? And does our job or volunteer experience in, um, help or determine if, or if we get accepted? Um, so yes, there is a resume as part of the application process. Um, and if so, if you do have work experience or volunteer experience, this is great. Uh, it, it does, however, play a minor role in the overall assessment of your application. Um, the real emphasis is on your written statement and your portfolio. Uh, but then we do take a look at your resume as well, uh, but also keeping in mind, again, that uh, coming out of high school, not everyone has had access to the same opportunities, depending on where you went to school, what you had access to, um, you know, just general differences in terms of privilege. Um, so your resume is helpful because it gets to we get to know you a little bit better through it um, but it, it plays a, ra a relatively small role in the overall application amazing um, we are running low on time so just want to give a fair warning that we won't be answering too too many more questions this next question asks I saw hack nights on your website what do those involve I, I can speak to this, maybe. Go ahead, Tess. Yep. Um, yeah, so Hack Nights are an essential part of the new media community. So I know we said community a ton of times in this presentation, and that's how important community is to the new media program. So we talked about our makerspace and our shoulder-to-shoulder, peer-to-peer learning that happens there. So Hack Nights are a time once a week, sometimes multiple times a week, where we invite students to come hang out in the makerspace and work on anything they want to work on. Um, so usually during hack nights, our whole staff team is there, our student staff are there, and a ton of the faculty and instructors stop by and hang out. And as I say, students work on really anything. They work on projects for all kinds of different courses. Sometimes students work on just projects of personal interest, but the value of something like a hack night is that you're just sharing space with so many people who have expertise that really runs the gamut of new media. And so, as I mentioned before, when you have a question and you're sitting in our maker space, in all likelihood, somebody in the room knows the answer and will be more than willing to help you because that's the community standards that we're built around. Um, and obviously right now we're in an online context, so we don't get to have that same sharing space opportunity. But what we've done instead is we've pivoted onto Discord, um, which is a chat, video, voice calling application. And so we still run Hack Night, we still run a makerspace. It all just exists in the virtual world. And we're also currently now, because we're virtual, have a really cool opportunity to also partner with schools all over the place, including OCAD, including um, NYU, so New York University and the Tisch School of the Arts there. And we have uh, another hack night facsimile called Nerd Night, where we work on projects with all these students from all over the place who are doing new media work, which is really exciting. Amazing, I see one, uh, I'm gonna ask two more questions. Uh, this one might be quick. Is there a Discord for the program? Yes, there is. And uh, right now, as we're online, there's lots of Discords for lots of the courses too. So we've got Discords all over. <laughs> Amazing, and to end off this presentation, maybe both of you can contribute to this question. What do you think is the benefit of studying new media in Ryerson and specifically in Toronto? Wow, that's a really open-ended question to end on uh, in the last minute that we have. Um, so new media specifically uh, at Ryerson, I mean, the one of the advantages of Ryerson, I think, versus, for example, um, a traditional art school, which is great, uh, but Ryerson has the advantage that we are immersed in all kinds of creative industries. Um, so we have, you know, connections through the zones, through different programs, and this is a 
a great place to yes learn about art learn about the the artist's way of solving problems and asking questions and making but then also be exposed to lots of other opportunities to apply that creativity to um, maybe more practical problems or more industry-oriented problems. So we're uniquely positioned to do that uh, at Ryerson because of the context we live in. Whereas if you go to a 100% art school, you may not get that level of exposure to uh, worlds outside of the art world. Um, and in Toronto specifically, well, I think Toronto is an awesome city. So uh, right now we don't get to experience it as much because we're virtual. Uh, but we have, you know, one of the oldest um, electronic media art center in Toronto. We have a thriving art uh, scene, and um, we, you know, have lots of great uh, uh, local resources as well for for new media. So uh, people who are in the gaming industry and the uh, immersive experiential industry, um, fabrication. There's a lot happening in the city. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add my two cents. I think the new media program at Ryerson specifically, there is no program like it in the world. Um, just the, the emphasis on community, the emphasis on hands on experiential learning, it doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, so the new media program, it's only at Ryerson. So that's why you should choose Ryerson. Um, but further to that, we talked about how close knit our community is. Um, we've also talked about creative practice hours opportunities. So those are uh, volunteer hours that you're required to complete to graduate the program. Um, and lots of those we do in-house volunteering with uh, all sorts of community events internally, but you can also volunteer externally and get your creative practice hours. I know for myself as a student, David talked about some of those experiences to get to work with the Ontario Science Center, to get to work with um, the Toronto International Film Festival. Those experiences exist because we exist inside of Toronto, because we exist in such a vibrant art space that exists in the city of Toronto. Um, so New Media is just such an exciting program and we're in such an exciting locale. Um, you really get to experience that feeling of downtown learning. So your campus is right in the heart of the city uh, and you get to you know, walk out of campus and be right in Dundas Square or walk off campus and be five minutes away from the um, art gallery. So all of those kind of opportunities that happen outside the world of new media are possible because of our physical location in Toronto. Um, but I'm a grad of the program. I can't say enough about it. New media is a really special place to be. Well, on that high note, I would like to thank both Tess and David for an amazing session. I'm sure that everyone at home um, learned a lot. I definitely did. And on behalf of Ryerson University, I'd like to thank you once again for joining us today. We hope to see you at our future sessions, not only um, tomorrow for the rest of our virtual open house, but beyond as well. And we hope you have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank and, you. Uh, again, I encourage all of you to uh, contact us um, anytime if you want to ask further questions.